All righty, well, let's get started um, with native plant propagation, which uh, we're talking really about the art and science of making more natives. And um, so happy to have you all here. Uh, thank you, Wild Ones of Appalachian Highlands. Whoa! For, uh, <laughs> for organizing this. So, okie doke. All right. And I do believe it's an art and a science, right? I mean, we think of horticulture and agriculture as kind of both uh, the artistic side, you know, selecting the plants, figuring out the places to put them. And of course, the science of how do we actually get them to grow? So, Really, at the basis, we say that uh, native plant propagation or any plant propagation is just the intentional increase of the number of plants. And we can do this through two main uh, means, or really just two means, uh, the sexual side, which we'll be talking about tonight, which requires compatible flowers of the opposite sex, and asexual, which is cloning, only requires one plant, or in some cases, just a piece of a plant. And so in March, we'll talk more about that, and uh, we'll be happy to have you guys here um, and, uh, you know, actually do some of that hands-on propagation. All right. And of course, my animations are going to give me a fit here. So, <laughs> all right. So, Sexual propagation is the reproducing of plants via seeds. And I gotta share, of course, one of my favorites, Asclepius syriaca, the common milkweed pictured here. And uh, of course, it's fantastic for many reasons, but I think one of the reasons that we're really uh, wanting to grow and plant more milkweed, of course, is due to the monarch butterfly. Uh, we can see the adult there as well as the larva. Let me see if I can get my pointer out here. There's an adult butterfly, the larval stage. So I'm sure you all probably know what that looks like, right? But um, if you don't, here it is, um, a striped caterpillar. And I, you know, in this case, it's almost like a pest in some ways, right? Uh, because if you're trying to grow milkweed, then you know the monarch's larva is going to eat your milkweed. However, there is a good balance there between it being able to eat and also the plant still being able to produce seeds. So we've witnessed that plants often are still able to produce seeds. So one of the things that I'll kind of talk about sort of good, better, best in practices, uh, probably the best practice uh, being to kind of have more of an organic approach um, so that we're not interrupting, you know, kind of nature's way of, of growing. So uh, here at the bottom, this is really what we want to see, a mature seed pod, which for uh, milkweed, it naturally dehisses, which means that it just splits open uh, when it is mature. And uh, one thing that we'll kind of mention is the chaff as well and removing the chaff. Now, removing of chaff is not always required, but it's the best practice, right? So, you know, good practice, you know, gather the seeds, better practice, gather the seeds and remove the chaff, best practice, gather the seeds, remove the chaff and stratify the seeds, which we'll talk more about here in just a few moments. So sexual propagation um, is kind of our, our chief approach uh, tonight, but we can also do asexual propagation, uh, cloning of plants, which is rather than the reproductive cycle, we're using the vegetative cycle. So think of vegetative cycle as, you know, the plant just growing new leaves, new stems, uh, not getting into flowering, ideally. Uh, when, whenever we talk about asexual propagation, it's better to have them still in that vegetative state. So just real quick, the main types of asexual propagation that we'll talk more about in March include uh, division and separation, cuttings, which I'm sure that we're all familiar with, layering, which uh, is a very successful, kind of more advanced technique, uh, grafting, which uh, can uh, have very 
good results if done uh, properly. And also tissue culture. And I want to highlight tissue culture here because this is also something that we might do uh, in sexual reproduction as well in just a few cases. And uh, again, we'll talk more about that uh, kind of towards the end of the lecture. All right, back to the fun stuff, though. Uh, sexual propagation. So, of course, sexual propagation begins with pollination. And that is the uh, transfer of pollen from the anther, which is the male part of the flower, to the stigma, which is the receptive female part. Uh, and fertilization is kind of that second part. So first we got pollen transfer, and then if everything goes well, there will be a pollen tube forming, which allows fertilization of the kind of immature seeds, what we call the ovules, which then will cause the carpal to swell. And think of the carpal as kind of just like any accessory tissue, often a fruit. If everything goes as planned, fruits and seeds are produced. You guys getting hot in here? If you do, feel free to turn that thermostat down. So here's what we're looking at, right? In terms of uh, pollination, you know, we often give credit to the bees. And, uh, you know, a lot of people are, you know, up in arms and giving a whole lot of attention to the honeybee, you know, and it deserves some credit because we get some sweets from it too. But for our native plants, really, we need to look at our native bees and trying to uh, preserve their habitat, which in turn, we will do so by growing native plants. So it's a, uh, one of those these are these things. Uh, so here's a native bumblebee. And you can kind of see here, this is a pollen sack on its leg. So uh, not only is it kind of storing pollen to eat, but you can also see pollen on its little hairy legs as well, that it is going to inadvertently cross pollinate. Um, in this case, a, uh, a blueberry flower, Vaccinium corymbosum, our uh, native high bush blueberry. Um, thank you, animations, for reiterating that. Uh, <laughs> so here's a diagram of that process. So uh, forgive my poor illustration of the blueberry flower, but uh, in the case of the blueberry, the uh, stigma, this receptive part, sticks out above the anthers, which the anthers are kind of color-coded here with yellow. That's where the pollen is going to be produced and then disseminated. So it's going to travel. Uh, it could be on the wind for some plants. It could be by uh, animals as well. I mean, bees are animals too, but it could also be by, uh, say, a bat, for instance. It all depends on kind of what organisms the uh, plant co-evolved with. And most of our flowering plants have co-evolved with at least one pollinator. Some of them a lot of pollinators. So anyway, in this case, we've got pollen being produced by the male part of the flower. Usually they are uh, a little bit longer and also smaller. It's good to have a little bit of botany in your back pocket to kind of know whether we're getting outcrossing or um, in-crossing. So usually with insects, it's going to be cross-pollination. So in this case, we've got a bee visiting that flower and it's going to have hopefully some pollen grains land on that receptive stigma. So you can see the pistil here is larger. The stigma is just this part at the top that the uh, pollen sticks to. And if it's compatible, we'll have number five here, a pollen tube will form, and that moves that pollen, uh, that male gamete, the sex cell, down to the ovules. So ovules are kind of like immature seeds, right? Or, you know, same as ovaries in humans. And uh, in a blueberry, of course, there's many ovules. So we'll have many pollen grains ideally landing here that then fertilizes. So once that pollen travels down, it gets fertilized and 
uh, you guys remember from biology class, a little meiosis taking place where the <laughs> chromosomes split apart and then rejoin. And that's important to talk about just because uh, if it's from two different parents, then we can end up with a totally different um, plant species, often a, well, not a species, but a hybrid is often what we'll get from cross pollination. Uh, and generally what we're talking about when we're propagating uh, native plants is what we would call open pollination. If you guys grow vegetables, uh, you're probably familiar with that term. Open pollinated just means that we're not restricting it. So uh, it could be a hybrid if it's open pollinated. And again, we'll talk a little bit more about that, but I just wanted to cover this really quickly. Pollination and fertilization is what we have to have to get not only uh, seed, but also fruits and ideally uh, viable seed. Let's talk about the parts of the seed real quick and just general stuff, not getting too specific here, but we have four main parts of a seed. The seed coat is the outside part that, uh, you know, that it's kind of a barrier to uh, prevent or allow it to remain dormant and prevent it from, you know, spoiling. The cotyledons, which are the first, uh, the seed leaves that feed the developing embryo. We also have the first leaves in a seed and also an embryonic root known as the radical. And uh, try to find a good diagram of a, a native plant here, but just pretend this is a pawpaw, right? So uh, <laughs> kind of pawpaw shape. It's a bee, right? But uh, in here, you know, the embryo uh, makes up a fairly small part of that seed. But when we have fertilization, then an embryo begins to develop. And we have to have an embryo or else the seed will never germinate. So that's, that's really the living part. I like to remind people that, you know, seeds are alive. They're just dormant, right? They're kind of like in a state of torpor or hibernation in a way. And what we need to do is try to figure out how to overcome uh, the barriers that prevent germination that keep it dormant. So often uh, we have to start here with an embryo, uh, but the other parts of the seed, the greatest part of the seed is typically food storage. That's in the form of the cotyledons. So think about, well, of course, it's a bean, right? So most of that, you know, when the bean germinates, most of that seed is actually just those cotyledons that then feed this embryo. And within that embryo, the radical, that embryonic root that first pops up or ideally down and uh, goes into the soil to then obtain food from the soil. There's also the first kind of true leaves they're a very small part of uh, the seed as well. All right, so this is important uh, for uh, several reasons, but uh, one of the big things is this knowing what the seed coat is, what it looks like, because it's protecting the seed, but it's also giving us a barrier uh, to prevent germination until the time is right. Okay, so we're, I'm going to take a quick aside here and uh, just talk about kind of what the types of seed that we're looking at. So a little bit of protocol about uh, what seeds we want to collect and grow. And of course, for us, we're looking at native seeds. So for that, we should correctly ID to the species or variety level. And I'm not gonna say that you have to be a botanist in order to grow native plants, but um, it's, it's always better if you know what the, you know, kind of, the parentage of the lineage of is of the seed. So trying to get it correctly ID to the species or variety level is, is I think is very important. And of course, we want to also think about the whole native thing, like native to where, native when, native why. You know, um, there's lots of things out there that are uh, plants out there that are labeled as native, but they're not necessarily native to here. You know, sometimes they're just native to North America. Sometimes they're native just to Virginia, which we have a lot of different uh, ecosystems in Virginia. So generally, I say we should try to aim for native to the ecosystem that you're working with. We're lucky because we have some of the highest diversity 
here in Appalachia. So there's lots of things to choose from. Um, and sometimes, I mean, it's not a bad thing necessarily to grow something that's native to Virginia, but not necessarily native to Appalachia. Um, I think uh, blanket flower, for instance, is a great plant. It supports pollinators, but it's native to the coast and not to the mountains. So one thing we might want to consider, the other part of that, native wind. Uh, plants move as well. So, and especially with a, a changing climate, uh, I'm sure you all uh, probably heard the news that we are now zone 7A. And uh, with that news, it's, it's like, yay, we can grow more stuff that was native to, you know, kind of south of us, but it's also like, wait a second, what's going on here? <laughs> so uh, anyway, we ideally want to correctly ID it to the species level and ensure that we're growing something that is actually native here. Uh, and somebody remind me at the end and I'll, uh, I'll go to the resource that I use and probably you all have already used, and that's the Flora Database of Virginia. That's kind of our authority in, in terms of whether it actually is native on the county level. So back to species. Species is uh, the specific epithet, which uh, what we're saying there is it's something that describes the plant. So we say genus and species together makes, uh, you know, kind of almost like a last name, first name kind of thing. Uh, it's, uh, we'll get some examples of that here in just a second. But the key to a species is the ability to breed with other individuals of the same species. And in nature, only the same species can interbreed. Well, most of the time, of course, everything that we talk about tonight, there's exceptions to every rule, actually probably a lot of exceptions. So most of the time, um, you know, species can interbreed. I mean, think of humans as example, right? We, uh, you know, homo sapiens can breed with homo sapiens. And what do we get? We get something that retains similar characteristics. So of course, us as progeny of our parents, we look like a combination of, you know, mother and father, and plants are the same uh, when it comes to that. Except often there are some, um, you know, magnitude of variation within the species. Sometimes there's like almost none, like a, a leaf shape will be the same uh, if it's, you know, cross-pollinated. Other times it's cross-pollinated, you can have a, a totally different flower shape or flower color. Hey, and that's just part of why uh, diversity of, of plant life is so important. So, but uh, a species, if it does interbreed, will retain uh, the distinctions through successive generations. Am I getting too sciencey on you guys here? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, we'll do that for sure. Okay. On occasion, different species of the same genus can hybridize. And we'll go to what I like to say, the curious case of Quercus, uh, which is the oak genus. So here we have, uh, and these are actually, uh, some of these are native here, but um, most of them, I guess, are a little more southern. But uh, on the left, we've got a uh, leaf type of a Quercus stellata. On the right, we've got Quercus uh, prinoides. And in the center, we have this they put that X in there, and we're going to call it, in this case, Steloides, because it is a naturally occurring hybrid of the two species. So if you see that X, it means that it is a hybrid. If we were to save seed from that hybrid variety, then there's going to be some uh, genetic uh, segregation that takes place in subsequent generations. So, which basically means if you save seed from Quercus X Steloides, and replant it, it could look like this leaf, or it might look like more like one of the other parents. So uh, oaks are notoriously difficult to identify to the species level, because let's just say they're a little bit promiscuous. They, you know, <laughs> they like to cross pollinate. Get OK. They know ginger number 159. <laughs> Okay, so uh, next thing, kind of below the species level, I want to mention kind of quickly here, uh, subspecies and varieties. 
So subspecies is the most generic taxonomically defined term, and it's one rank order lower than species. So it's genetically or morphologically, the shape of it is distinct among other subspecies that belong to the same species, yet it still produces viable offspring from interbreeding. Sometimes when we have hybridization, we get sterile seeds and they won't grow. So that subspecies, you are able to grow them. We also have variety, which uh, you'll see that abbreviated as VAR. That's a natural variety, and it's another step below that of subspecies, but above another taxon form. It's a plant that differs in one major characteristic, but does interbreed. So uh, this is often due to some sort of mutation, and often the varieties and subspecies are kind of geographically distinct. So in one area, you might have that. And I mention all this uh, because they can look different, right? And again, trying to ID it down to the species, or in this case, subspecies or variety level, uh, can be very important in terms of how successful our uh, propagation exploits are going to be. So this is a sundew, Drosera menziesia, of the subspecies basifolia. You can see how that is distinct from the straight species here, uh, Drosera menziesia, uh, in that it has that foliage kind of tightly uh, held to the stem around the base of the plant rather than uh, the foliage kind of being uh, further out. So that's just one example of the subspecies. And let's look at a, an example of. Uh, a variety, uh, honey locust in this case. So Laditzia tricanthos is the species name, the specific epithet of the honey locust, which is a nice native tree. You should probably double check that, right? Is it native here? I think so, because this image I took on the creeper trail and I kind of doubt someone was creating around honey locust seeds and just throwing them out in the woods. Uh, this is a response of herbivory, so if a deer feeds on it more, it'll be more heavily armed. So watch out for your honey locusts. What a lot of people do today is plant this variety. So inermis basically means thornless or spineless. And you've probably seen these. If you've been to Cumberland Square Park in Bristol, uh, that's, uh, they planted a bunch of these. Uh, they don't produce fruit and seeds. Uh, so what we have here is something that has been kind of adopted in the nursery trade because it's better behaved and it's it's more friendly. I bet in some cases, uh, especially now with the uh, increase of homelessness in the population there in Bristol, they probably kind of wish they would have just planted that straight species. <laughs> Sorry, that might have been a little controversial there. But, <laughs> uh, also, want to just mention real quick the uh, I think the importance of. Uh, trying to learn a little bit of Latin, not that everybody needs to know all the Latin words, but it does tell us something, like inermis being spineless or thornless. All right, so native R is last thing I'll talk about, and we'll, we'll get back to the good stuff. Um, native R is a cultivar of a native plant, and this is a term that was coined by uh, Alan Armitage. She was written a lot about um, herbaceous uh, landscape plants, especially. Um, I've got a book back there that uh, he edited that is, uh, it's like almost 2,000 pages uh, of just listing varieties. And so he coined this term native R to kind of say that these are native plants that resulted from either natural or in some cases man-made cross-pollination to try to create something uh, new and different for a variety of reasons. So this word provenance is, uh, I think, important to us, right? Especially when we think about Appalachian Highlands and being native here. Really, we're saying where that plant originates, the ecosystem that it kind of evolved in. And hey, we know that many plants are not just native to one ecosystem. They, they're kind of generalists and they can be all over the place. But for us, provenance does play an important role, especially if we're considering wanting to grow uh, wildlife habitat plants. Um, it's going to be best to support our own native wildlife that, that actually came from Southwest Virginia. So the question is, is 
do we get all the benefits of using natives uh, with a native R? And I'll just look at a couple of examples here. Um, here on the left is um, uh, the New England aster, aster uh, or Symphiotrichum nova angliae, if you want to go with the new botany, which, by the way, um, we prefer the new botany because it's based on genetics and rather than the old system where it was just based on what it looks like. This is a native R right here next to it. Notice that it's got a whole lot more flowers, right? This is uh, Alma Pukshki, um, which I know sounds very Russian, doesn't it? Uh, so it's very floriferous, kind of a different color. But what are the ramifications of that? So in uh, one research study, which this is kind of a, it's, it's not well researched yet, but uh, in one study they found that this got very few pollinator visits when compared to the straight species here, uh, just Aster nova anglia. Now, on the other hand, this is a Monarda fistulosa bee balm, uh, which this is kind of our purple flowering bee balm. And you can kind of see the same deal here where it's in this image. Um, and I can't remember exactly what variety this is. Uh, but you can see it's it's kind of like triple the number of flowers. And it was found that in a study of Monarda fistulosa in this cultivated variety that uh, pollinators were equally happy to visit either. So we don't know for sure if native ours are, you know, as good as native. So I uh, wanted to mention that just because what are we propagating? You know, and it's important to have that that lineage. Uh, real quick, just a few reasons that we might have native R's. This is what the native R people say, right? Uh, could be earlier or later blooming, uh, could have larger flowers, as we just saw in that image. Could be different colors of the foliage or flowers. Maybe it's better behaved, right? Uh, smaller, more compact. Maybe it holds on to its fruit rather than uh, dropping it and making a mess. And these are things that, uh, you know, horticulturists look at in terms of the popularity. You can also have different shapes and sizes of the flowers. And here's just a couple of examples. I think this is a beautiful plant. Um, this is, and I can't remember the, the variety right off, but this is a, a cardinal flower, Lobelia cardinalis. I think it's like called lava or magma or something like that. And it's got different color foliage, maybe a few more flowers as well. So it's, it's pretty, right? It's we might want to grow that because of its a you know ability to be a botanical curiosity. Uh, however, we found that it's not nearly as hardy. So we uh, planted it years ago. It came back maybe two years. Uh, we got some sub-zero temps, and it's gone. So and that's one uh, potential ramification of using a native R. <laughs> The uh, better behaved here, this is a uh, Joe pie weed, uh, uh, Eutrochium. And I, this is actually called Little Joe. And it's great, right? Because it's short. And I guess that's great um, for, you know, maybe commercial landscaping. But, you know, in my house, I'd be happy having a, you know, nine foot Joe pie weed. Uh, but, you know, for some of us, maybe that's just not what we want. So Little Joe over here. You know, there, there might be a reason for propagating that, saving the seed, and replanting. Okay, so back to the seeds. Uh, gathering seeds. Uh, ideally, we want to gather, uh, we're really going to talk about two types, very general. Uh, one being dry, one being wet. So dry seeds, uh, ideally, we want to get uh, the most mature seed out of anything. So that just means the embryo has developed further. So uh, in this case, I've got a, now this is a basil, so it's not a native plant. Uh, however, this is kind of what we're looking at, right? It's almost completely dead. I mean, it is completely dead. For some reason, the work studies keep watering it. But uh, <laughs> if I were to uh, take one of these little seed pods and kind of, I like to just, you kind of just, grind it up with my thumb and forefinger. You can kind of see in here that they're a little dark and hard 
C. <laughs> So it's like you would expect. Okay. Yeah, uh, usually completely mature. They're almost always going to be hard and uh, com ideally completely dry. Easiest way to go about it is to let it dry on the plant. The downside of that is that if you've got weather incoming, then the more rain that it gets on that dry seed, the less viable it's going to be. Uh, usually they're dark. So brown or black typically, not always though. Uh, and it may need stratification. And usually I think of stratification as uh, it improves the germination rate rather than it's required. For some, it is absolutely absolutely required and it, a seed will not germinate unless it's been stratified. So I wanted to pull up this uh, birch here. This to me, like it's not quite ready yet. Uh, and you can kind of see that there's a little bit of kind of green in this catkin still. So that's not yet mature. So uh, really we want in, in one of these catkins is probably, I don't know, a couple of hundred seeds, maybe more. And each individual one kind of looks like this. But this is really what we're going for here. Something that's darker, harder, and ideally, again, completely dry. If you you can get seeds that are still, you know, maybe damp, but then you want to dry them out further. Uh, and that's mostly for a dormancy thing, right? We want to keep them dry so that they remain dormant until we're able to plant them. And uh, this is a, a probably a hybrid, I'm thinking. This is a, a round leaf birch, probably crossed with a river birch uh, based on the foliage, which of course is gone now. But uh, one of my students grew this plant, uh, a couple of them, out of, uh, say, we didn't count them because they're small, but out of about 200 seeds, we had like four germinate and then grow into trees. And it looks slightly morphologically different than our um, round leaf birch, Betula uber. So, all right, we'll talk more about stratification now, which can look like a bunch of different things. Uh, could be like the the winter sowing you see here or and with the oak seeds here we've got um acorns um we basically just got them in a ziploc bag uh with some you know something like this with a different media uh these are persimmon seeds in here in this bag and uh you can see students use the um uh, kind of long fibered sphagnum moss you could just use straight up potting soil uh, you could also, in this case, hey, and by the way, uh, labeling is very important. <laughs> Notice that this has some green writing on it, but uh, that paper towels do work as well. But uh, I've asked students to try to label with as much detail as they can. Uh, so lots of different ways that we can get this stratification. But in general, stratification is just a cool, moist period. And usually what's happening there with that is that the embryo is continuing to slowly develop. And it's simulating, or in the case of winter sowing, it is winter. Uh, we just have them in here because we can, we can keep them safe from uh, herbivores, or I should say uh, cedivores, right? Uh, or also it's kind of like getting a little greenhouse effect too. So you'll start to see some green popping up in there. That means it's time to get them out of that and into a warmer place to, to try to grow. But uh, winter sowing, you uh, I say upcycling, um, things like olive, old olive oil containers. I like the thicker ones myself, um, the kind of old milk jugs. Uh, they're a little flimsy. Yeah. But uh, this can be extremely successful, and it is you know basically winter. So often we'll stratify in a refrigerator or a freezer depending on the seed. Now I found that uh, pawpaws do not like to be frozen. So that's where we put them in the fridge. Of course, with the fridge, you gotta watch out because if you're storing them with like vegetables or fruits, then uh, they can give off ethylene gas, which can cause them to sprout prematurely. So usually we say some water holding substrate uh, if it's in a container, which uh, again, you know, many different ways to go about that. I don't think there's anything wrong with paper towels. We just want to make sure that it's staying 
uh, ideally moist, not wet, right? You don't want it to be like dripping wet, soaking wet. You want it to be to have just the right Goldilocks amount of moisture. <laughs> uh, so usually there, it's for X number of days, right? So there's all kinds of figures out there. Um, I think probably in general, we want to do like a minimum of somewhere between 30 to 90 days is usually what is printed in the literature. Um, but some, you know, if, as long as you're simulating it probably more than a month, it should uh, facilitate uh, germination once you bring it into a warmer place. And sometimes they will uh, germinate in very cold temperatures. Of course, if they do germinate, you want to recognize that yeah, they can be a little susceptible. So keep that in mind. So that's stratification in general. Um, for Mostly for dry seeds, although there are some, you know, kind of wet seeded plants that have pulp as well. Uh, talking about the wet seeds, usually we're talking about extracting these from a fruit. So it, again, we want it to be mature. Uh, so if it's an edible plant, probably past its prime edibility, right? Usually if it's, if it's good and edible, it might not be fully mature yet. <laughs> Bless you. So again, fully mature. Um, there's not a great indicator and because it can be many different colors, shapes, and sizes of fruits. And often these uh, wet seeded plants will need to form um, or need some form of scarification. And so scarification, um, think about you know what happens to a fruit, right? Uh, I mean, what, what does happen? goes through a digestive system. You, yeah, exactly. Usually through a digestive system. So that is uh, in it itself a form of scarification. And a lot of these plants have evolved to disperse and kind of use that fruit as a bribe, saying, okay, here, bird, come get me so that you can take me far away from my parents. Nobody wants to live with their parents forever, <laughs> right? Uh, and then uh, deposit me somewhere on a fence line or something. So... It's often what happens. So that scarification by a, a chemical means, uh, hydrochloric acid probably, uh, but we there's many different ways we can simulate that. So for example, I'll uh, kind of use the, the easiest, I think, uh, Passiflora incarnata, one of my absolute favorites, the passion flower, state flower of Tennessee, by the way. Um, notice, I mean, which of these do you think is going to have the most viable seed in there? Probably this kind of wrinkly one, right? Um, a different color, right? Uh, probably a little bit past prime edibility. Anybody ever eaten passion fruit? It's delicious. Uh, so yeah, we have a, a wonderful native here in passion fruit. Here's a cross section of the fruit. Uh, pulp is what we're looking at right now. So back when I was mentioning the carpal, that's that accessory tissue. In this case, it's got these little sacs it's kind of like placental tissue in humans right so it's it's kind of feeding that uh, developing embryo and if we were to take the seeds out of uh, these sacs we would find that they're probably very dark and more textured so uh, that's kind of what we're looking at in terms of fruit usually a little bit past edibility um, for uh, passion fruit i found that Really, the best thing, easiest thing, is just to let it ferment in the, the pot itself. Uh, rather than extracting it and going through all these steps, you might not get as many plants out of it. But I mean, let's face it, one passion fruit is probably enough. Um, okay, so more on scarification. This could be physical or chemical. So we're kind of more talking about chemical when we talk about uh, fermentation or um, passing through a digestive system. Which, by the way, you could uh, always uh, just follow around uh, animal uh, feces and uh, <laughs> extract some seeds. That way, you'll probably get some really good scarified uh, seeds. <laughs> Actually, they uh, recently did a uh, research study in uh, Glacier National Park following uh, bears or looking through bear scat and kind of planting the scat in a greenhouse to see what they have been feeding on. So and people do it. It's a dirty job. Somebody's got to. <laughs> what we're looking at for scarification, though, is we're actually altering that seed coat. So it could be using sandpaper 
or fouls or some other form of abrasion uh, or scoring. Um, and that's probably more simulating kind of freeze thaw cycles and, you know, kind of gravel and stuff kind of abrading a seed. We can also, of course, do the fermentation as we talked about. That's standard practice for peppers and tomatoes. Uh, your fermentation will greatly increase the germination percentage. We could soak it in a, a, a weak acid. Uh, be careful with that, right? Uh, we have uh, students in our Plant Life of Virginia class uh, do this every year, and we have them do the research and say, all right, what, what did you find is the best way? And invariably, we almost always have somebody say, all right, we need to soak it in acid. Of course, we have a, a chemistry lab, so and we might get some sulfuric acid or hydrochloric acid. And maybe they didn't dilute it enough. So we're like, all right, soak it in acid for 30 minutes. We come back in 30 minutes and the seed is disintegrating. So <laughs> be careful with that. Sometimes scarification, though, is just soaking in hot water. And, uh, you know, if you want to get scientific on it, you know, usually about a, uh, over uh, 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So here's what some things that, you know, could be scarification. Uh, I do this every year with my bean seed, right? Uh, you'll see some swelling taking place. And really that's the seed kind of imbibing. So that hot water is gonna kind of uh, weaken that seed coat. And then it's able to take water in and come out of dormancy. Could be using a file, in this case, a knife to a sharp knife to just kind of nick the seed coat itself. We're not trying to like cut it open all the way, but we're trying to just penetrate that seed coat so that we can get water in there. Um, <clears throat> this is kind of looking like softening the seeds here. Um, if you guys buy seeds, which, you know, there's lots of sources of native plants out there. You know, one of the, I think, uh, more well-known sources is uh, Prairie Moon Nursery. But, uh, you know, where are they getting their seeds from? Mostly from the Midwest, right? They're based in Minnesota, I believe. So. It's like if you buy that, it, they have a lot of great information that can be applied and they will they'll have a lot of the same species that are native here. But when it gets to the provenance, right, it's not really the same. So just want to mention that. Also, we have double dormancy, which uh, double dormancy is kind of both, right? So stratification and scarification. And uh, the pawpaw is the classic example of that. So first, Check out our fruit here, right? Our fruit is starting to turn color. Um, so it's, it's often pawpaws turn like a kind of golden or yellow color. So you can see that in the skin, it's gonna be a little softer too. Um, so you can stratify and then scarify or vice versa, scarify and stratify. Or what I prefer to do with the pawpaw is just do them both at the same time. So I'll, uh, I'll leave some of that pulp surrounding the seed so it ferments uh, and it will ferment kind of during the stratification. So uh, the, my first success with the uh, pawpaws was just planting the whole fruit in a pot, really deep pot because they are very taproot. And this is kind of what's going on here. Uh, for double dormancy, it's a very slowly developing embryo. And I'll say also with pawpaws um, being a wet seed, they want to stay wet. So if you let it dry out, it's dead. Um, so keeping it moist from the get-go. So and again, I think it's great just to keep it in the fruit itself. You're not going to get as high of germination as you would if you extracted them and you know, went through all the process. Uh, but also sometimes we'll just dissect the seed and uh, look to see if there is a living embryo in there. With pawpaws, it'll turn like a tan color instead of a dark brown you'll know that the embryo is dead in that case. You can see that from the outside rather than actually dissecting it. But this is kind of what it's looking like. So <clears throat> almost a year for pawpaws. So I find that if I gather them in say September, plant the whole fruit um, after I've you know, kind of processed what I want to and have my fill of pawpaw, which is pretty easy to do, uh, then uh, you know, come back later on, um, Usually the next summer is when they start to sprout. So about probably nine months is what we're looking at for this embryo to go from this to you know, more something like this, a well-developed embryo. 
So the harder plants to propagate from seed might need or might have double dormancy and need both stratification and scarification. All right, so planting them, right? We could either directly seed them in the ground in their final home, uh, which you know invariably has some success, and that's what happens in nature, right? But if you think about a plant in nature, it's producing a whole lot of seeds. That's its strategy, so that just a few germinate. Um, so if we take some extra steps, kind of artificially stratify, then we'll get um, many more plants out of it. So when it comes to substrate, again, you can use really anything. Uh, the key is to have good soil to seed contact. So I prefer a finer media. So if I say I'm using just straight up uh, potting soil, I might add vermiculite or perlite to it just to get a little bit better uh, soil to seed contact, making it a little bit finer. Does that kind of make sense? So that it's going to hold enough moisture to prevent it from drying out, but not too much moisture, which then would maybe promote pathogens, rot from happening. And so if we're going to uh, do that kind of more artificial, then we can transplant them to their final destination, which I kind of prefer. Uh, and we can use germination flats for that. That's kind of our go-to. That could be anything, though. I've seen people use wood. Uh, we usually go with plastic. I know we don't need more plastic in the world, but um, it's just it's easier to work with to say that. So maybe upcycle, right? Something that was a plastic tray that was going to get thrown out. Um, so on the flats, you know, it could be something like this. Notice that there's some maybe some uh, drainage in it. Uh, it doesn't have to be, though. Uh, usually I'll kind of double up the flat. So I use like something like a web tray um, with a, a kind of solid plastic tray. And, uh, you know, keep it moist, right? That's kind of what we're looking at here. So, <clears throat> and if everything goes well, then we will have some germination. So I'll pass these around. These are uh, bee balm that students uh, gathered this year from the Mount Rogers High Country. Um, <clears throat> and you can kind of see that a whole lot of seeds, these have been stratified for 30 days um, and they germinated really well. Um, so we might over sow in some places and then thin them out to ideally, we wanna just have one seedling per area to make it more successful. So those are little baby bee bombs that will be for sale later on this year. All right, so germination rate. I know we're running out of time here, so I'll try to quickly move through so we have uh, a moment to ask some questions, have some discussion. But uh, just want to mention germination rate. Of course, that's pretty plain and simple, the percent that sprouts. So if we have 75 out of 100, 75%. So just a few things that we've seen. Asclepias syriaca, our common milkweed, which uh, seems... Just from my personal observation, seems to be the best for monarch habitat. Doesn't mean that it is, but it's just what I've seen. Uh, we went from with zero stratification, about 30%, to 90% with 30 days stratification. Uh, Betula uber, that's the round leaf birch that uh, we passed around earlier. Uh, it went from 3% uh, to 30% with stratification. So what I'm saying here is that stratification is going to improve it. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to improve it vastly. Uh, maybe just enough to get a few plants out of it. Better than none, though. And then, of course, if a semina trilobit, the pawpaw, increased from 0%. We, uh, when we tried to do it without stratification, we didn't have any germinate, to 75% with both stratification and scarification. Just as I described earlier, planting the whole fruit and letting it come up. So the germination rates are affected initially by seed viability. So again, we want it to be mature. And if it's dry, it should be dry. If it's wet, then the fruit should be uh, maybe past its prime. It's also going to be affected by temperature, <clears throat> both the uh, stratification temperature, but also the temperature of, if you're moving it indoors, ideally into a greenhouse if you've got that space. Could be in a sunny window still if you don't have a greenhouse. Um, we want it, ideally, I mean, room temperature is probably okay, 
but uh, we want to try to look at like maybe springtime temperatures to get them to wake up. You gotta maintain moisture, of course, it dries out, it dies out. And the type of plants. So some plants, you know, I'm sorry, yeah, they're just not able to be propagated easily by seed. And uh, I'll, we'll talk about one of those examples here in just a second. Also, proper uh, preparation. So we've gone through the steps, say one, uh, separating the seed from chaff. Um, I found that out the hard way uh, by saving a bunch of, this was beans, not native, but uh, still kind of a, a good case. Uh, saved a ton of October beans, which we love to grow. And uh, went back in March to see, all right, I'm going to plant these seeds. Guess what? Weevils had invested them and they had eaten through pretty much every single little bean. So sometimes our chaff can harbor uh, like insects or insect eggs. So that's kind of what we're talking about, proper pressure preparation. Also, uh, some cases, seeds should be uh, sowed on the surface. Those that require light, most seeds you want to put under the soil surface and that would, you know, simulate darkness, of course. Also, of course, the quality of seeds. So, Usually the darker, the better, the more mature, the better. All right. And uh, here's what it looks like, right? And again, you can kind of see, uh, well, these are beans, but uh, in, in sand, right? So sand is a medium. You could use a substrate that you could use, um, but you can kind of see those parts of the seed kind of coming out of dormancy and, and coming alive. So real quick, let's talk about the advantages of sexual propagation. One, it's the quickest way to get a whole lot of plants started at once. It's usually pretty easy. It's economical. But we have some disadvantages as well. All right, so uh, one, some plants, especially hybrids, do not reproduce true to their parents. So in the case of our uh, probably hybrid birch over here, and I think it's a round leaf cross with a a uh, river birch, probably. Um, also, some plants are just difficult to propagate from seeds. And I'll kind of leave this on this example here. And uh, this is uh, some work that we're getting ready to embark on with uh, DCR. Um, they uh, We helped with some treatments of an area where this plant is growing, um, basically thinning the canopy out. Uh, you guys know this plant? Mm -hmm. Cypripedium regine, the showy lady slayer. And uh, after kind of going in there, uh, clearing the canopy to get more light penetration, uh, it flowered this year for the first time um, in like eight years, as far as we know anyway. And they found a seed pod. So uh, they gathered the seeds and uh, currently are stratifying them. Um, and then I think we're gonna get about a hundred of them here to try to uh, culture. Uh, in this case, uh, orchids, which uh, we think of as, I mean, they're, they're amazing plants, right? Maybe the highest evolved. However, orchids have uh, often evolved to just uh, be co-evolved with one single pollinator. So it kind of restricts their ability. In addition, often uh, the seeds need a mycorrhizal uh, associate. So we're talking about a fungus, basically, that that works with this seed. So in order for us to actually grow this, uh, at least what the literature says, uh, you will have to uh, start it on aseptic media and give everything the fungus would give to it as a symbiotic relationship. So we're basically gonna be kind of feeding it on a sterile uh, like agar based media, like a gel. And hopefully we'll be successful because this is an extremely rare plant and we're kind of on the uh, fringe of its native range. So uh, trying to get it propagated and hopefully um, back out in uh, the place where it originally came from. So that's, uh, that's the story, I'm sticking to it. And I think that concludes the presentation part. Uh, who's got questions? I've got something I'm just curious about, and that's uh, you know, the term stratification. You know, when I think of, is it derived from stratum, strata, you know, which I think of as layers. So, yeah. why that term to explain that process? That's a great question, uh, to which I do not have an answer. Okay. But uh, 
Um, yeah, I imagine maybe it's just talking about, you know, the substrate, maybe? I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, good one to look up um, the etymology of. Great question. Uh, another thing, you know, like if we, if we want to collect seed, uh, you know, kind of take us through the ethics of collecting native seed in the wild. Oh, excellent question. And uh, I would just say that uh, when it comes to collecting seed from the wild, uh, really what we want to try to avoid is that we're over collecting. So uh, we say this with the foraging, like we want to do like one tenth of any harvesting so that we're not really interfering. Now, again, thinking about, you know, how many seeds say in this basil plant here, I mean, We've got probably hundreds of flowers, and each of those flowers probably has, you know, six to 12 seeds in it. So in that case, you know, it's, it's probably fine to, you know, gather the whole plant out of the population. But we want to try to minimize our impact on uh, wild areas, um, ideally gathered from private land. Now, you can get um, permits to gather from um, other land, public land. Uh, but you know, ideally you want to have some permission to do so. Um, so again, you know, try to minimize our impact. So, you know, 10% or less is really what we're looking at. So we're not interrupting, you know, wildlife's ability to have food or the plants to kind of re-sow themselves. So, yeah. Miss uh, or Simon, say, did you ever come up with that person to take and uh, Property that uh, persimmon trees mine. Oh, and now I have talked about woody come up and yeah. get pawpaw trees, right? And you put different ones onto those trees, and then when that guy come in there and destroyed all them while I was at the nature center, they come back and they didn't have any fruit on. Mm -hmm. And Woody said to take and go back and uh, tap into them and put a different. Uh, yeah, that's a that's a good example. Um, persimmon are uh, dioecious, so they've got a male and a female tree. And ideally, we want to have both male and female flowers on the same tree to get good fruiting. So that's probably what Woody was talking about. That's what he said. And he said he wanted to work on the trees, but he didn't have the parts to do that. With. Yeah. But he knew somebody that did. He's going to go. Oh, okay. And we were going to get somebody to go up our and salvaging trees after I got them to come back. I haven't heard from Woody, but uh, I'll check with him uh, and yeah. see if he's got something. Yeah. Uh, you can get, which we'll talk more about that with the grafting in uh, our asexual uh, workshop in March. Um, I think that's March 14th. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Check your schedules, right? Um, and we'll do some hands-on grafting too, but uh, that's something that I would suggest, you know, it's not really required just to have a native plant, but if you want fruit, then uh, with the persimmons, it's certainly required. What was the fruit on the inside of that pawpaw this year? What's that? Was it a spoon and a fork? Oh, in the persimmon? I think uh, most people I talked to saw uh, forks. Uh, or I'm sorry, no, it was spoons. I apologize. Whichever one means supposedly heavy winter. This thing. Yeah, that's spoon, right? Fork means it's dry snow, right? And then knife means it's just going to be cold. Um, okay, I've got a couple of questions here in the chat. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jim Bixby asks, when time permits, could we repeat the reference to the native plant database, which uh, I thought I understood to be focused on the county level within the state? Yeah. Um, so let me pull that up for you. Uh, you're seeing where I'm scalping images from. Uh, <clears throat> the flora of Virginia uh, database is uh, what we're looking at. Uh, this one, let me share my screen again. The digital atlas of the Virginia flora. So if we go there, um, and I don't know, somebody give me a genus or a species we want to look at. Okay, let's look at let's just look at Solidago. That's the goldenrod genus. You don't have to necessarily know it. You could use the common name too. But uh, I like to to use that because it's going to bring up any Solidago species. Which wow, as you can kind of see, there's there's a whole lot in Virginia. So um, 
and it can be difficult to identify down to the species level. Um, when it comes to identifying them, I look at this first. Say, all right, is it actually here? So let's say uh, Solidago rugosa, wrinkle leaf form. You can kind of see that there's multiple varieties as well. And look, it is uh, native to almost every county in Virginia. Uh, and probably these empty counties just hasn't been observed there. It's probably native there. Can, can you search by county? Uh, unfortunately, you, there's not a tool yet to search by county. Uh, maybe someday there will be. Um, actually, maybe there is now. Let's see. I don't know exactly what this is going to come up with because I haven't looked at that, but let's just take a look at Washington County. Vascular plants, uh, bryophytes or mosses. So, so it looks like that gave us all of them. Which, uh, not to make it, give anybody vertigo here, but uh, as you can see, wow, that's a whole lot of plants that are native to Washington County. So, yeah, it does. Do you have a group of people, or did you ever go home to land and see what all is available? Now that you can take off, and I guess you'd say spread its glory somewhere else. Absolutely. And uh, I think, especially in the face of development, Right. Uh, so if you guys see, you know, beautiful wild places that are being developed, then, you know, that's a clear indicator that maybe we should talk to a uh, realtor or um, homeowner, landowner and say, hey, can we maybe take a look and save some of these plants where you're yeah, getting ready to. What about that? You know, I told you a long time ago, I've got all that land over on the mountain. Mm -hmm. And I left it over at the conservation for years. While I'm still upright, I want to get rid of it. Sure, let's go. But I want to go in there at what is usable, salvageable, and able to take care of. Because it's been there since before 1945, and nobody's ever touched it, walked through their mouth. Well, yeah, I'd love to go out there and take some students out. And uh, we do, we have students do an inventory project in the Plant Life of Virginia course every year. So they'll look at an area. Um, we usually ask them to do two different areas and kind of compare them. So maybe more of a cultivated site versus a wild site. And yeah, we'll do those inventories. And, uh, you know, we're not trying to necessarily find every single species. Well, but you took us up on the mountain. We went through that swamp. Yeah. And that bog. Yeah. You gotta go through the river. So they gotta have boots. Yeah. <laughs> so you gotta I'm prepare serious. properly for sure. I'm serious. I, I've never built a road. You know, there's a road. You <clears> go so far. When you go over to what I've got, which is 6.29 acres, that's a lot of land. Yeah, and I would say um, in that case, the one that you're talking about, we went to, on a field trip with Claiborne Woodall, our uh, natural area steward, and he uh, he basically took us to Big Springs Bog and Grayson Glades, which are natural area preserves that are not open to the public. Um, if you want to go, you have to talk to Claiborne. Um, but uh, so we did do some inventorying of species there, but uh, strictly no seed gathering. Um, that's the DCR's kind of um, you know perspective on it. It's more for conservation. Uh, you know, however, there are some cases where if it's a you know very sensitive species that they you know might partner to try to propagate. So, but yeah, public land, absolutely. I mean, sorry, private land, absolutely. You know, we'd be happy to come out if anybody has any places oh, as time oh, allows. I want you to do it at yeah. SIP. And well, let's wait until uh, the plants are up. So. <laughs> took care of. I, I want it. Whatever's there that can be salvaged, I want it salvaged. Okay, let's take a look here. Um, I had a kind of amateur question. Oh, yeah, please. Um, so in not knowing all the species and not being super adept at identifying them, I often resort to prairie moon because it's easier. They say, this is what it is, and this is how you stratify it. So when I'm, you know, foraging and finding my own seeds, often I'll be able to identify the plant when it's flowering. And yeah. then once it's a mature seed pot, I'm like, what was that again? Is there something like seed that can help you to identify when it's in that, um, later mature stage or is there a database that says hey this is what this type of goldenrod pod looks like 
or something like that, just so that I can know what it is. And right. then the second layer to that is um, on that website, can you, does it tell you how to stratify those things once you do ID it? Um, uh, like a fruit and twig dichotomous key. Yeah. Or yeah. something like that. Uh, I mean, a, a dichotomous key is the best tool, okay. but that can be. Uh, so yeah, it's, like? it's a book or it's an app. So okay. the, the Flora of Virginia app is, uh, is okay. good. Um, they, they're not great though with seed. So the, yeah. I mean, the best thing to do is, and I would say that with, uh, you know, any, any goal you have, and I should start with a goal in mind. Like I want to propagate this plant to plant here or there, or just to have to share it with other people. Um, like for instance, uh, the bee balm back there, I, you know, told students, I was like, let's, that's one of our, our targets, right? We want that scarlet bee balm. Uh, Minarda didyma. Um, so, I mean, yeah, I think recognizing the plant when it's in its flowering state. Um, and there's also kind of a, a phenology thing too, right? So um, blooming at different times. So that bee balm, there was one that was still red, right? Still had flowers on it. And then the rest of them nearby, if we can recognize some of the simple patterns, like a uh, square stem, opposite leaves, and the fragrance, that we could also have some that were mature seed too. So, uh, you know, in some cases you'll get that where there is enough genetic diversity and variation to where there will be some that are ripe and then some that maybe aren't right next to it. That could be a great way. Um, but probably for most of us, the best thing to do is uh, take the approach of multiple trips. And that's, again, why I think it's good for private lands because you could, uh, you know, tag it, um, maybe use some flagging, uh, a stake or something, uh, and you know, maybe make a note somewhere of this is this plant, and I'm going to come by in X number of weeks and look at it again. Uh, so, yeah, unfortunately, there's not an easy way around it. Seek is great. I love Seek, um, but it's not great at identifying it from just seeds. So, yeah, in some cases, um, you could also just gather the seed sow it and then see what comes up. Um, that's, it's actually a, a pretty decent approach, even though it seems like, well, duh, <laughs> of course I could do that. But, um, you know, I, that's fun to, to kind of see, all right, a surprise. It actually did come up. But I would highly recommend Seek as a, you know, to identify them initially um, and then kind of, you know, double check your references because, uh, and I like to use Seek with iNaturalist. So, you might get the identity from Seek and then post it to iNaturalist. And then you've got a peer community that I confirms the identity. And also it gives you your location, right? Yeah, it geotags it. it. Geotags it so you know where you were when you identified that particular plant. So you could go back to that location. And David said different views and disagreements on what to do about or for the homeless are fine, but there should still be a measure of reverence and respect. Oh, yeah, yeah. sorry about that. <laughs> sorry, David, didn't mean to offend. Uh, Terry said, do you re recommend a website for reference, uh, re-exact procedure for individual species? Um, there is a great uh, woody plant guide um, that the U.S. Uh, Forest Service puts out. It's free, it's a PDF. Uh, just search for woody plant propagation, uh, USFS, and it should come up for you to download. Um, that's for woody plants, though. Uh, unfortunately, for the herbaceous plants, uh, especially our kind of local natives, there's not a whole lot of literature out there. So it's getting better all the time with the Internet, but uh, it's still not uh, perfect. So uh, in terms of a website or reference for exact procedures. I don't have any single one, but um, I'm a Googler. You know, the Google uh, image search, if yeah. you take a picture and then you can search the image from the picture, mm -hmm. that can get you started. Absolutely. It takes a lot of judgment, you know, once once you start getting results. For the yeah, I often use uh, Google image search uh, using Google Lens if you have an Android. Um, Okay, Donna said, I agree about Prairie Moon, excellent resource, um, but not the best uh, of seeds slash plants for our area. Uh, so, yeah, these are great. Roundstone, native seed, is, is better. Um, wood thrush is about as close as you can get um, there in Floyd County. Um, 
Mellow Marsh Farm, I'm not uh, familiar with. So uh, there's also Shy Valley, maybe yeah, some natives. Yeah. yeah. They're, they're nearby. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a few. Uh, it's getting better. And uh, I, I would say, you know, uh, Wild Ones of Appalachian Highlands is probably a great resource because you guys are all working on this, right? Um, feel free to shoot me an email anytime. I'm happy to help with ID or anything like that. I'll just drop it in the chat here. It's bcastile one at vhcc.edu. If you uh, send it to B Castile, it'll probably get to me, but it's got to go through Bridget Castile and the nursing first. So. <laughs> okay, let's see what else. Um, I'm not going to go through every single one of these, but I, I think we do have some, some good notes in here. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, Terry Joyce said stratification refers to layers of derived from strata and rock layers. Why? I still don't know. But... Um, okay. If you just to get back out into a place where that you didn't have coverage on their body, yeah. Is there a book? We had those books that we got out of the uh, bookstore. Um, the, there's lots of great field guides out there. I think probably the best one for our area, the one that we use the most, is uh, Wildflowers of Tennessee in the Southern Appalachians. Um, but uh, now we have a great resource with Southwest Virginia natives, right? So, which I've, I've got back here somewhere. Um, of course, you guys have. Uh, have kind of created that uh, guide. So um, I'll see if I can find it here in a second. Okay, Kathy, I, uh, I'll just say again that database is the Flora of uh, Virginia, uh, Digital Atlas of the Virginia Flora. I'll make sure I'm seeing that right. All right, uh, Nick Douglas said, when collecting seeds of a rare plant in a state park, we were told to collect from no more than 10% of the stems and to collect no more than 10% of seeds on any stems. It's a great uh, rule of thumb right there, a great guideline. Um, and, you know, again, like state parks often will give you permission, but it's better to ask in this case. I was told you had to have a permit. Yeah, usually they want you to have a permit, but uh, sometimes that permit is just permission, right? You ask a ranger and they'll say yay or nay. Um, national forest is uh, more lax. So you, you can often do uh, more. I think for personal um, use, you, there is kind of like a, a blanket rule that it's okay uh, for a personal collection, depending on the species. I mean, I think there are, of course, there are protected species that you gotta you need to be aware of. Again, why we have to or want to try to get it down to the species level or variety. Well, you said before, we couldn't get that ginger or that um, fern. If you're on private land, can you take it off? Oh, yeah. Yeah, if you're on private land, then it's kind of if it's yours, it's up to you, right? Or, yeah, as long as you have permission. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> don't, and don't just go trespassing on someone's private land. Uh, Okay, so Gail said there is a group called Native Plant Rescue in Chattanooga area, so there is a process there. So it's it's been done. Uh, maybe we should have one here. Uh, Karen Quisenberry said, I hope it's not too late to plant common milkweed seed outdoors. It's not. Um, you know, I think uh, 30 days of uh, stratification is what um, we've had success with. So I actually have a bunch that students went through right here, and I'm like, okay, it's in a, a paper seed packet, um, we'll still try it out. So didn't make it to the, the cooler yet, uh, but I still have high hopes for it. So yeah, I don't think it's too late, but I would probably opt for artificial stratification, taking those seeds and putting them in a bag or some other container, maybe doing the winter sowing method. Okie doke. Here's a good resource for, that Mary shared um, for Tennessee and Kentucky. Tennessee-Kentucky Plant Atlas, USF.edu. Not familiar with that one, but it's a good one. Open that up, check it out. <clears throat> we have a lot of overlap with our, our neighbors. So 
Okay, uh, Lisa said on the Digital Atlas website, when it lists plants by county, there is a column titled native status, either an N or I. Uh, I stands for introduced in that case. So uh, let's actually go back to that Digital Atlas and look at an example of that. Let's we do uh, the one we were just talking about, Cypripedium regine, the uh, showy lady slipper. Okay, well, I was hoping it would have some sites maybe where it was introduced, but there's one population in Washington, one in Giles, and a couple in Northern Virginia. Um, yeah, we could do uh, Traxicum dandelion and see what it introduced. So we get blue, uh, that means introduced there. Um, I'm kind of curious here because I see another Traxicum here, red seeded dandelion. I'm not familiar with that one. Introduced as well. So um, that's a good point, too, um, talking about natives versus introduced versus naturalized, kind of interchangeable terms that you've probably heard, right? So naturalized, you know, it was not native. And usually the definition for native is it was here before, you know, colonialism, basically. So um, how do we know that? <laughs> uh, I mean, we look at historical records, um, but, you know, Native Americans also moved plants in trade, lots of plants that they moved. So it's like, was it really native? And I, you know, that kind of gets to this point that, uh, you know, native plants are kind of in flux, right? And um, the, one of the reasons why we have such amazing diversity here is that uh, with the topography um, and kind of our central latitude in North America, we've got uh, southern plants moving up as uh, ice retreated from the last ice age. Uh, northern plants were kind of isolated to mountaintops. So uh, Mount Rogers, the kind of Fraser fir, uh, red spruce ecosystem is one of our most um, endangered ecosystems in uh, in the country, if not the world, really. So, okie doke. Um, Gail asks, where can you find this recording? And we'll share that back out with the uh, wild ones. So they should have it um, once this finishes, uh, we'll share it with them and you should be able to get it there. And if you want a copy of the presentation, I can uh, probably also share that with uh, Wild Ones or you can also email me and I'll, I can put a link together for you. All right, I think that covers all the questions. Any other questions in here? All right, well, I hope to see you guys. And well, uh, the final thank you from us. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, my pleasure, thanks for being here. Um, yeah, I mean, we're, we're working together on, um, you know, making native plants more accessible. So I appreciate all of you. Hope you all have a wonderful day and I hope you stay warm. This will be a, a useful documentation oh, very good. of your community involvement. So thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Well, I appreciate you all. Have a lovely evening. And we'll look forward to seeing you guys for eight sexual propagation in March. All right. Cheers. We'll be back.